Let's take our Bibles and look in Jeremiah chapter 7 as we continue our reading commentary here through Jeremiah. And I'm going to read down to verse 20 for this reading. Make some comments as we go. Let's just remember that Jeremiah was prophesying just on the years, a few years left before God would raise up Babylon and take Judah, the tribe of Judah, the remaining tribe of Judah into captivity and destroy that temple. And we're going to read here about how they had a false presumption that as long as that temple stood, they'd be all right. But people today that say, well, you know, the United States is a Christian nation. There's no way God would ever judge this nation. Well, I believe the judgment has already come in the spiritual sense that men are in darkness and their deeds are evil. They love darkness rather than the light. But here we find Jeremiah in verse 1. And notice these aren't Jeremiah's words. This is the inspired word of God, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Notice it doesn't say the words. I like whenever I see that singular, the word, I think of Christ the word. But this was a revelation of Christ to Jeremiah that came to him. Remember, they mocked our Lord when he stood before those religious leaders of his day saying that before Abraham was, I am. So even here when we read this, we have to understand that any revelation of God through his prophets was through his son. Peter said that. He said the spirit of Christ which was in them did testify. So this is a solemn revelation here. Jeremiah wasn't out there on his own. He wasn't speculating. He was not speaking unless the Lord gave him that word. And so the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, stand in the gate of the Lord's house. So here's a message that was preached at the temple gate. That temple in which these people, that religious generation, put their confidence and thought, so as long as it's standing, we're all right. And he said, proclaim there this word. Again, notice the singular, not these words, but this word, the word of the Lord, and say, hear the word of the Lord. So in three instances, we have that specific word, singular. All ye of Judah that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord, that's why they came, and yet their heart was far from him, but they went through the motions, and they appeared there at that gate under pretense, like so many today. They go to their places of worship under the pretense of going to worship the Lord, but the question always is, is it the Lord that they worship, or is it a God of their own making? God of their own imagination. I'll tell you, the God of Scripture is an offense to people today that claim to be Christians because they've never been taught of him. They've been taught about a God, and they've been told that he's a God of love, and if they'll just go through these certain motions, as preachers tell them to do, walk an aisle, say a prayer, bow your head, that somehow they're going to be okay. Make your profession and then stick with it. That's not the worship of the Lord. But that's like these here. They came for these religious festivals three times a year, whether it was the Passover, the Feast of Tabernacles, or the, or the Feast of Weeks. They, they came, as the Lord commanded, to Jerusalem. And so here, Jeremiah is called to preach in that temple gate. Now, if you go over to Jeremiah chapter 26, verses 8 through 11, you'll have an idea of when this was taking place. It says here in Jeremiah.
Jeremiah chapter 26, verse 8. Now it came to pass when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak unto all the people that the priests and the prophets and all the people took him saying, thou shalt surely die. This is the type of Christ in the temple when they would have taken him and caused him to be killed. So such was their desire. And it says, why hast thou prophesied in the name of the Lord saying this house shall be like Shiloh and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant. And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. And when the princes of Judah heard these things, then came they up from the king's house. And who was the king at this time? They go back to verse 1 in the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. They came up to the king's house and the house of the Lord and sat down in the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house. So this would have been in the days of Jehoiakim, which if you remember when we're studying through kings, was one of the final kings that reigned there in Judah. He reigned 11 years. Jeremiah would have been prophesying here in his first year. So, and then after those 11 years, he died during the siege and his son then was taken captive into Babylon along with 3,000 some other Jews at that time. I just point that out to say we're just 11 years or less removed from when all of this would take place in Jerusalem, the city, the temple would be destroyed. But they didn't see the urgency like so many today when you preach God's condemnation. People don't see it. They look around, they look at their neighbors and they think, well, we're all all right. But thus saith the Lord of hosts, verse 3, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. So it's not just in words only to amend your ways, but your ways and doings. And some would look at this and say, well, God's already determined the judgment. Why does he even say amend your ways? Well, God's a God of justice and holiness and can demand nothing less than repentance. And had they repented, then certainly the Lord would have withdrawn his hand of judgment. But man without the spirit of God cannot repent. He can only be hardened. And that's what we see taking place here. But he says, trust ye not in lying words, saying, here it is, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Three times it's cited. They put their trust in the fact that that temple still stood in spite of the word of God. Like so many today have a false sense of security, irrespective of their ways and their doings being contrary to the God of Scripture, they go about their traditions, and their ways of worship as if nothing was. You can imagine even some of the false prophets of Jeremiah's day twisting the Scriptures and in essence saying that the temple could never be destroyed. God would never do that. We have that in our day. Because God had promised an everlasting dynasty to David. And God had chosen that place to cause his name to dwell there. And so people took that for granted. And a hundred years before, remember, when Assyria, the Assyrian army came down and took the ten tribes of the north. But God preserved Judah and Benjamin, the tribes of the south, that that built a certain presumption that, no, look, at we're special. God would never destroy us. And you can imagine this is what the false prophets who read on in Jeremiah were saying in the day. They found Jeremiah to be the liar. But all this was faulty reasoning. It's like so many today that 
put their confidence in a false profession, false hope, or false faith. They don't heed what the word says. Now today, we don't necessarily say the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, but people, you might like it to say, well, I go to church, or I made my profession, and so, as some say, I'm as good for heaven as my own name. They believe they're preaching. Like one man said when he was asked if on his deathbed if he had a good hope, he said, well, I do if my preacher has been telling me the truth. Well, you don't want that to be your hope. And so he says here, if thou truly amend your ways and your doings, what that is is to completely renounce any works of the flesh, any dependency upon anything that with which we would appear before God with our own works, the works of our own hands. Cain's religion. That's what he's saying here. He's, he's saying the same to these as, as he said to Cain, that if you do good, which means go get a sacrifice, a true sacrifice and come, then you'll be accepted. If not, sin lies at the door. If you truly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you oppress not the stranger, see, all of these were saying they were the Lord's, and yet they acted evil toward their neighbor. They were self-serving, oppressing the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, shedding innocent blood in this place, in this place, right there at that temple door. Neither walk after other gods for your hurt. Now, this is really the sum of the law, isn't it? To love your neighbor as yourself and to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And there's some that make an effort at loving their neighbor, and yet they don't love God. They do it for self-serving reason. Notice here, neither walk after other gods to your hurt. So it was a mixed religion. It had nothing to do with Christ, who was what that temple represented, those sacrifice, the priesthood, but they were blind. He said, then will I cause you to dwell in this place in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. We know that if God has preserved Israel today in that land, it's not because of them. It's because God promised that he would preserve them. That's his faithfulness, in spite of their faithlessness. You can go over there today they're the greatest God-haters in this world. If you stood on a corner in a street in Jerusalem and preached that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, they'd arrest you. They still hate this Christ, and yet they pretend to be God's favored nation because God had said, as long as the sun rose and the, the moon shone, that he would preserve that nation. That's the only reason it's preserved today. It's not that he's awaiting some kind of thing to happen over there. No. He's just being faithful in spite of their unfaithfulness. But here's the problem right here. In verse 8, Behold ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. Same thing today. Lying words. People believe in a God who wouldn't hurt a flea. God is love. There's a wonderful plan for your life. That's what's being preached. Just give your life to him and you'll be all right. They don't know a God of holiness and justice and anger and wrath unless the Lord Jesus Christ has paid the sin debt of a sinner. There's no hope. We steal, verse 9, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, and or even burn incense unto Baal and walk after other gods whom ye know not. You see this syncretism in their religion. On the one hand, they give lip service to, to God of the scriptures, and yet on the other hand, they're burning incense unto Baal. It's like people today, they say, well, it doesn't really matter where you attend worship as long as you attend. Really? Where did you get that? If Christ is not being preached, then it's false worship. Christ, as he's revealed here in the scripture, not just mentioning the name Jesus, but again, the gospel summed up in those five questions that I've always reiterated. Who he is, 
according to scripture, why he came, what he accomplished, for whom he came, that's important, he didn't come to try to save everybody, and where he is now, ruling and reigning, victorious. Otherwise, it's another God. Here it says, and walk after other gods whom ye know not. And come and stand before me in this house. So here they are. They're out there doing all this cavorting with these false gods, and yet they present themselves of it as if nothing was, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations. Boy, I'll tell you, there's some people that say they believe in grace that are just like these folk here. They believe, well, we're elect. We were left before the foundation of the world, so what does it matter what we do? It can't change anything. Or they preach up grace. That's all grace, grace. Don't talk to me about being under condemnation. And so they, they live their lives turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. Or even worse, they plead the blood of Christ. They say, well, it's all under the blood, so there's nothing that can condemn me. That's what these were saying. You come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do all of these abominations. That sin abound, that grace might abound. That was the thinking then. And so he says, is this house, which is called by my name, You'll recognize this, become a den of robbers in your eyes. Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. Did not our Lord use this very portion of scripture when he cleansed the temple, accusing those in his day of having made that temple a den of thieves? They had no interest in him, didn't know him. Didn't realize or acknowledge that all that that temple typified had to do with him, his person, his work. So when he says here, but go ye now unto my place, which is in Shiloh, where I set my name at first. You have to remember that when the Lord brought Israel into the land of Canaan initially, that the tabernacle stayed in Shiloh. For hundreds of years that's where it remained but ultimately it came to an abrupt end remember when we were studying back in first Samuel chapter 4 that the Philistines overran shot and that's where they took the Ark of the Covenant and then finally the Assyrians when they conquered the northern kingdom of Israel many years after that they destroyed Shiloh. By Jeremiah's day, Shiloh had been in ruins for a long time. And that's why the Lord says, you that say here, the temple, the temple. Think back a little bit to Shiloh. For 400 some years, it stood. Where I set my name at the first and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. So he's reminding them that that's what's about to happen to Jerusalem. He said, I spoke to you rising up early in verse 13. And now because ye have done all these works, saith the Lord, and I spake unto you rising up early and speaking, but ye heard not, and I called you, but ye answered not. See, that has to do with the general call of God. Many are called, few are chosen. So it's not saying here that God was somehow impotent in converting them. No, he's just reminding them that he spoke to them through prophets, rising up early, but ye heard not. There are those that, like in Christ's day, he came unto his own, his own received not, but as many as received him. There were those that did receive him, but Many received him not. Why? Because the authority was not given them to believe. And that's the condemnation that 
exists today, even in our nation, around the world. It's not that the gospel call isn't going out. The Lord has his prophets, his preachers, declaring, not many, but declaring Christ and exalting him. The problem isn't with God or with the gospel, but the hardness of men's heart. Ye heard not. I called you, but ye answered not. That just proves that unless God by his spirit does a work of grace, men will remain hardened in their sin. Therefore, verse 14, will I do to unto this house, speaking of the temple, which is called by my name, wherein ye trust, and unto the place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. Where was Shiloh at this time? It was nothing but ruins. And I will cast you out of my sight as I have cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. He's talking about the ten tribes of the north there. And here's an interesting statement. He's, he's given this word for Jeremiah to declare unto them. A lot of people think, well, if God is causing the word to be preached, it must be because he, he wants them to be saved. Verse 16, there's, there's a word that goes forth for salvation of God's elect, those that Christ would be, but there's a word that goes forth for condemnation. And here the Lord says specifically to Jeremiah, therefore pray not thou for this people. So this was definitely a word of condemnation. Neither lift up cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. I'll tell you, as a preacher of the gospel, there's times where I don't know what the Lord's going to do with the word. There are times that he gives a burden and you pray for different ones, but there's times where he takes it away. Takes away the cry, takes away the prayer. You still declare the word, but sinners remain hardened where God has purposed condemnation. Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire, women knead their dough. For what reason? You, you say, well, those are all normal activities uh, of daily living. Well, look what it says, to make cakes to the queen of heaven. The idolatry of Judah and Jerusalem here was a family affair. The children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire, the women need their dough. So they're all together as a family. That's what's being preached up today. Everybody's a family. Just take your kids, everybody, go to your place of worship. But again, who is being worshipped? Who is that God? Here it was to make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings under other gods that they may provoke me to anger. The queen of heaven, that was the Babylonian Ishtar was the name of that queen. It would be likened to Venus today. And there were similar goddesses that were worshipped among the Canaanites. It's as if the Lord was preparing them to go into this idolatrous captivity nation where what they were doing even before they went that's what this nation did. Of course, today you hear about the Queen of Heaven, the worship of the Roman Catholic religion, where Mary is given that title. And that should set off alarm bells for anybody, I would think. That it's not the worship of the, the true God. But beware of family worship. A lot of people think that, well, we've got a whole family going to church. That's the way they put it. That doesn't mean anything. For all you know, you may have be sealing them in condemnation, you and your family, if it's, it's not a place where Christ is exalted, Christ is preached. He says, do not they provoke me to anger, that they may provoke me to anger? Do they provoke me to anger? saith the Lord, do they not provoke themselves to the confusion of their own faces? For a while, that false religion may seem to bring happiness. Like they sing, will the circle be unbroken? That's what that's the whole goal, everybody being in heaven. But 
It'll be to the confusion of their own faces when they stand before a holy God and find they have no ransom, no mediator. Did they not provoke themselves to the shame of their own faces? And so God answers in his provoking wrath in verse 20. He will stop here. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, mine anger and my fury shall be poured out upon this place, upon man, upon beasts, and upon the trees of the field, upon the fruit of the ground, and it shall burn and shall not be quenched. That's a picture of God's eternal condemnation that awaits any that do not have Christ as their mediator, Christ as their sacrifice, Christ as their ransom. Gracious Father, may our hearts be stirred as we've read your word once again, not to just read this as past history, but to consider even our own state before you, that we would not claim any other hope than that which is in you through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his finished work at Calvary. And that as we gather for worship, that he indeed would be uppermost in our hearts. It's not by our actions or doings or physical religious activities, but that from our heart we would be brought by your spirit of grace to truly worship you, even in this hour. To the honor and glory of your son, we give you the praise in his precious name. Amen.